grew up about three or four miles from this church here in Llanover, which is near Abergavenny, South Wales, but knew nothing about Robert Jermaine Thomas or this church or anything to do with career. I was living in America at the time. I wanted to learn more about the spiritual changes that had occurred in Wales during the Welsh Revival, and that set me on a journey to come back and forth to Wales. One day I was passing this little church, never paid any attention to it, but for some reason was constrained to stop the car and look at this little church. The door was open, I came in, and uh, I thought, this is strange, seeing Korean or Far Eastern tassels on a pulpit, a photograph of a young man, a map of Korea. And then it became a, a journey for me to find out who was this young man. My husband came home from Wales and he said, oh, I've got this really great story and you might want to write about it. So as a writing teacher, I thought, hmm, I, I might like to write about this man, you know, Robert Jermaine Thomas. Robert Jermaine Thomas was born in Ryader, which is a small town in mid Wales. Robert's father, Robert Thomas, had been a minister in Glandor, Swansea. A good number came to Christ under his ministry. He came here in 1847. If you look at the history of this area at that time, it was a time of great upheaval socially. Children, mostly around here, had a very poor life, but Robert's life here in Llanover was very much one of privilege. He was a bright boy, and we think possibly with the support from a Lady Llanover, who had established a private school in Llandovery. Robert got to that school when he was about the age of 12 or 13 and matriculated, but even from a young age, his passion was the Bible like his father, because from that pulpit, he preached his first sermon at the age of 17, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today forever. And this is what he says in a letter to New College when he was trying to basically tell them that he wanted to become a missionary. He says, I thought that men of good education of strong constitution, with ability to acquire languages were wanted for the work. And I wish to offer my services more in the spirit of self-denial than anything else. I do most firmly believe that I am appointed by God to be a missionary and that he has implanted this preference in my heart. Robert went to London, to New College London. New College was being formed by the independent churches, the Congregationalist essentially. We also know that within a short while he left college, partly because he wanted to preach. He went to work alongside a physician, thinking that if he was going to the mission field, he needed to know some medicine. He spent about six months or nine months there working with this physician, also preaching when really, in fact, he should have been at, back at college. He had to reapply to New College to let him back in. And it was the support of distinguished ministers and one particular professor who saw that this kind of feisty and raw student had some qualities that they let him back in. He proved himself finishing a year before he should have his studies and graduated at the same time from New College and from London University his passion increasingly began to be mission. The London Missionary Society was establishing stations within China as China became open to Western trade. Within a short while of him graduating, in fact, he married, he'd met his wife, Carolyn Godfrey, fell in love, they were passionately in love, and they together decided that uh, God's call on them was for the Far East and for China. He'd already studied some Chinese and uh, he was to be based in Shanghai with Muirhead, who was the station chief there. We know sadly about the passing of his wife, Carolyn, within a few months of them arriving in China. 
They arrived in China in the December of 1863. Shanghai, which was very difficult, a lot of crime, the atmosphere was bad, pollution, uh, poor hygiene. I think he found it difficult with Muirhead, who was the station chief at Shanghai, wanted him to teach English to the Chinese noblemen and those who could afford it. But he warned Thomas not to mention Christ and the gospel. By the March of 1864, his young wife has died as he came back from Nankau. My dear Dr. Tidman, I little thought when we left England that the final letter from myself to you would contain the mournful tidings. My dear wife died on the 24th of last month. The news has quite prostrated me. It was utterly unexpected. And a few days before her death, she, it appears, was shocked by the news of the death of a beloved wife of an American missionary residing there. That shock brought on a miscarriage, which took place on the 20th. My heart is well nigh broken. I feel weighed down by deep grief. It was thought that he made a hasty decision to leave the London Missionary Society, but he was also appreciated in the area for his gifts of language. And the customs office at the time that was in Chefu actually approached Muirhead, the station chief, and Robert, and said that uh, someone of his skills and aptitude uh, could still be used. Robert went north to uh, Chefu, the port of Chefu, and which was the key port and the nearest port to uh, Korea, Choson. When he was then working in the customs office, I think he got his second wind. He began to kind of uh, meet people that were meaningful to him in his life, like Williamson, who was the head or person for the Scottish Bible Society. And in came the port, these two travellers. And they were wearing crosses. And Williamson was intrigued by this, got to know them, and then he introduced Robert to them. Robert found out that these traders were Catholic believers and as he could engage them in language, he found that they had a faith, but they had no Bibles. Williamson then, the, the man from the Scottish Bible Society, commissioned Robert to be a call porter of the scriptures, to take the scriptures. Robert, in the August of 1864, resigned from the customs office and set off with these two traders. My dear Dr. Tidman, we left Chefu on the 4th of September on board a small Chinese junk and arrived off the mainland of Korea on the 13th. We spent two months and a half on the coast. I had acquired through the assistance of a Korean Roman Catholic sufficient knowledge of the colloquial to announce to these poor people some of the most precious truths of the gospel. They are, as a whole, very hostile to foreigners, but by a little chat in their own language, I could persuade them to accept a book or two. As these books are taken at the risk of decapitation, it is quite fair to conclude that the possessors wished to read them. After his first missionary trip, he left Korea, came back up through Manchuria to Peking. In Peking, he had a much better reception by Edkins, who was the station chief. Edkins saw the qualities he had. He requested that Thomas become a teacher in the school. He, he set up a, a place for him to preach the gospel. The Taewon Gun, who was the prince regent, who was ruling Korea at that time, had threatened the people. They had stone monuments everywhere, warning the people not to talk to any strangers because they knew that there was an expansionism going on by the Western world. 1866, the Taiwan gun was to kill, wipe out 10,000 Catholic believers. The French missionaries, two of them escaped and got to Peking. The French delegation in Peking approached the mission society and said, we hear that you have a man who has been 
to Korea. He knows the language. He knows the coastline. We're looking for such a man. Robert longed to get back to Korea. He had a longing to take the scriptures back there again. He would go whether it was with the French, where was the first boat back, the first opportunity. The Missionary Society requested Robert to go with Admiral Rose. So he waits in Chefu. We learn that the, there's trouble in French Indochina. So instead of coming into Chefu, Admiral Rose took his fleet down to Saigon. Thomas was stuck there in the port in Chefu. Along comes this boat called the SS General Sherman, an American boat. We learn that the Sherman wanted to trade with Korea and requested that Thomas join them on this journey over to uh, Korea, which Thomas thought this was another opportunity. Dresses in his Korean garb and armed with his Bibles, he goes on this boat, the General Sherman and they crossed the Yellow Sea over. They went back to White Winds Island, which was the island that he had first uh, come to on his first missionary journey. People remembered him, and the people accepted his Bibles and his books at great risk. He preached numerous times on that island, and the pilots who came on board the ship to direct the ship up the, the Tedong River warned Captain Preston, look, you're coming in, this was now September time, you're coming in on a flood tide, but before long, it's going to be shallow water again. The ship then stops at various villages along the way as they make their way up the Tedong River. Every market he preaches, he hands out the scriptures. He was welcomed because there were Catholic believers in a number of these villages. There was a deputation that came on board the Sherman, and we learned that seven Catholic believers came on board the Sherman. Robert welcomed them, he talked with them, he gave them copies of the scriptures. They also told him that, they, that the ship wasn't welcome. We know that as it journeyed up the, up the Tedong River, it eventually came as far as the eastern gate of Ponyang. Ponyang was the key city of the north. This is where the governor of that region was told by the Tawangan you must take out this boat, take no one alive. Hostile crowd gathered along the banks of the Tedong River at night time. When they saw that the hostilities had increased, they fired their muskets and possibly a cannon at the people that were gathered who had started shooting bows and arrows and muskets at them. Who fired the first shot, we'll never know. All we know is that the Sherman was there at the eastern gate of Ponyang City with deep water and under the cover of night and fog, tried to make it back down the, the Tedong River out to the sea. They'd gone in on a flood tide. It was now, the tide was receding, the high waters were receding, and it's a bend in the river. And I visited that island, Sook Island, that the Sherman ran aground on very, very shallow water. And they then decided to burn the boat and what they did, they got scows or like flat bottom boats, loaded them with timber, right, dry tinder, set fire to them, and floated them down into the Sherman. The Sherman was a, a gunboat full of gunpowder. It exploded, the crew came ashore, they were chopped down immediately, they came to the shore. Robert, we learn, came ashore with a white flag, with Bibles in his hand. He'd already thrown Bibles into the shallow waters and onto this island, which is where the boat ran aground. You could easily do that. We know from the first-hand witness of there was a young boy of 12 there with his uncle, Cho Chi Rang. Robert actually handed a scripture to him and handed a scripture to the executioner because he knew what had happened. He saw what had happened to the fellow crew members and knelt on the ground at the command of the executioner bent his head and was beheaded. He was buried where he was executed and on Sook Island, which is a small island in the Tedong River. The London Missionary Society who had hailed his first missionary journey as a great feat for them. He had written about it. They'd published it in all their journals about they'd taken him back on as a missioner because he'd left the London Missionary Society. But sadly, the Missionary Society now distanced himself and it took months for them to acknowledge even his death. There was only a one-line statement in their magazine. But in terms of the gospel, 
That was the seed that was set. And we next pick up the story in 1890, when Samuel Austin Moffat, the first full-time missionary, went into North Korea and met the 12-year-old boy, Cho Chi Rang, that had met Thomas. He met the children of the executioner. The people that Thomas had reached on that first missionary journey, several of them became elders in the church that Moffat was to establish. Tertullian, the early church father, had written, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Samuel Austin Moffat was thrilled when he learned of Thomas's work. So he commissioned his assistant to interview the people that would have met Thomas. We're told that the executioner took the scriptures and uh, papered the walls of his home with these scriptures. And uh, that uh, this young boy later purchased this home, Cho Chi Rang purchased this home. That very home became the first house church in Ponyang. And later they were to build a big church there called Cho Chi Rang Church, where the 1907 revival broke out. Robert was a man before his time. He, he dressed in the garb, it was tr transcultural, if you like. He dressed in Korean clothes. He, although he was from a non-conformist Protestant background, his passion was to bring the word to fellow Catholic believers and also to those who knew nothing of the Christian gospel. So that's what I find interesting about him. He had a big heart uh, for the gospel of Christ. I think Robert Germain Thomas wanted to bring life, he wanted to bring love and joy and peace through the scriptures. Unfortunately, there's often suffering because we're in a battle, because there is so much evil in the world too. When you do good, you often suffer. But I don't think we go in to say, I want to suffer. We suffer because we want to follow Christ. Robert uh, Germain, Germain Thomas's uh, martyrdom uh, was uh, the seed uh, for um, Korean revival and Korean church. Um, now, after uh, Robert Germain Thomas was uh, martyred, um, Korea started to open uh, its door. That's when the missionaries from Presbyterian background and um, uh, Methodist denomination, from mainly from uh, USA, they started to come in and um, they started to plant uh, churches, they started to um, build uh, theological seminaries. Korea was um, a bone of contention uh, between China and Japan for, for many years. Japan started to have more influence politically uh, and culturally, I guess, uh, in Korea from that time onwards. Now, one San revival uh, started uh, from 1903 and lasted until 1906, but its impact had much deeper influence uh, to the growth of the um, Korean Christian uh, communities to this day. Now, how Wonsan Revival was first sparked off is really quite remarkable because it started with uh, Dr. Hardy's uh, personal confession of sin. So like all other revivals uh, in Korea and perhaps elsewhere in the world, uh, it started with a profound a sense of guilt and confession of sin, but at the same time a profound um, understanding of um, salvation. I mean, Dr. Hardy first uh, found it very difficult. He has not been able to produce any results or fruit in his ministry uh, in Korea. And um, he later also confessed that uh, the Holy Spirit prompted him to confess his sins publicly. One of the um, things that uh, Dr. Hardy confessed was precisely uh, his um, racial prejudice, uh, prejudice against um, uh, Korean people. Now, I think what he meant was that uh, he, he had this, um, I guess, a racial um, a superiority in, in a sense as a, as a white uh, Western missionary uh, who was in, in a very heathen nation, a backward nation such as Korea at the time, and to civilize uh, these people with the gospel and uh, with uh, his teaching and so on. But he felt that that wasn't quite the spirit of uh, a, a missionary. So he felt that he need, really needed to uh, confess his sin in having that pride, in, in falling into that temptation of pride when reaching out to uh, this uh, uh, indigenous people of Korea. And when he confessed uh, his sin publicly, uh, people were deeply uh, moved by his confession. And in, in, in return, 
that the audience uh, actually confessed you know, their sins to him uh, for not uh, being so open uh, to his message and teaching. And that had a major impact, not just amongst um, Korean Christian community at the time, which was, very, uh, which was a minority at the time, but it also had uh, a, such a repercussion and, and, and such a significant influence on people uh, outside the Christian community. Very important uh, theme of Korean revival is, is always the, the repentance of sin. I don't think you can talk about um, Korean revivals in isolation uh, from people's uh, understanding of sin and salvation uh, that the Bible offers. A Pyongyang revival started immediately after the Wonsan revival, and that's when the revival started to have real fruits uh, in, in the history of um, Korean Christianity. When people um, started to gather uh, in a prayer meeting, people started to pray out aloud, and that turned soon into weeping uh, in repentance of their sin. So the Pyongyang city, uh, due to the revivals and people coming to Christ uh, by repentance, that quickly uh, earned its reputation as the, uh, the Jerusalem of the East. And uh, there were many converts. And um, in Pyongyang revival from 1907 onwards, that's when the revival started to have a real uh, fruit. Uh, and um, the gospel was, uh, had a stronger impact uh, from that time on. Of course, uh, one may question uh, the relevance of um, public confession of sin in normal circumstances, but uh, I think we must understand that in Korean, during the Korean revivals, the Holy Spirit genuinely uh, came upon and touched the lives of people uh, in those times. So, so it was not caused by a human intention or deliberation, but it was genuinely established uh, by, by, by the Holy Spirit. And that characteristic style of um, uh, a prayer or worship or repentance, if you like, uh, can uh, still be seen even today in some Korean churches. Jonathan Goforth, missionary to China, was visiting Pyongyang in 1907, wrote, A Japanese officer at the time of the revival was quartered in Pyongyang. The strange transformations which were taking place not only among great numbers of Koreans, but even among some Japanese, who could not possibly understand the language, so puzzled him that he attended the meetings to investigate. The final result was that all his unbelief was swept away and he became a follower of the Lord Jesus. Not only does revival um, establish and restore uh, our relationship with God, but the revival has also restored the relationship uh, amongst each other. The Korean um, revivals um, produced a very solid uh, sense of a Christian community uh, in Korea. Korea is um, a very community-based uh, nation and um, uh, people have um, a very a corporate mind. So their identity uh, is defined by the community. And I think that's perhaps one of the cultural aspects as to how um, Christianity spread so quickly and so strongly uh, in a, such a short period of time. Korean church uh, in its initial stage, um, especially um, during the um, uh, early 20th century, would have been quite similar, I think, to that of um, early churches. Uh, when the early churches in the Bible, they were under uh, threat and persecution by the, uh, the ruling authorities, the Romans at the time. Korean uh, history at the time was, um, uh, was historically a very uh, chaotic um, period. Uh, especially due to um, Japanese invasion. The Korean churches in general uh, would have been under a tremendous level of uh, persecution and threat by the Japanese and by the ruling uh, dynasty of Korea. And of course, uh, the Korean War as well in 1950s. Even though that they were uh, persecuted and threatened, they continued to grow. And I think that's the fundamental principle of the cross. The pathway of the Christians uh, it's not an easy pathway, and there's often a persecution and suffering, but that also uh, grants way to the pathway of um, the glory of resurrection. And I think that biblical principle uh, were very much applied and very much um, a reality in Korean revivals. The Korean Christianity really uh, started off in North Korea 
uh, and um, Pyongyang is the capital of uh, North Korea now. But because of the persecution of um, uh, Christians and the new uh, communist regime, they were forced to move down to South Korea. And that's where Christian, Christianity really uh, blossomed. What we can learn from these um, Korean revivals is the restoration of our relationship with God as well as the restoration of our relationship uh, with each other. And uh, we live in a very uh, you know, individualistic uh, society these days. And I think those um, fundamental um, uh, characteristics of Korean revival have very important lessons uh, for uh, the churches today. I believe that the, uh, the spirit of the revival, which was sparked from that specific time, 1907, still has repercussions even today in Korean churches. Oh, John.